The Stonewall Inn on Christopher Street in Greenwich Village was owned by the Mafia, who in 1966 invested $3,500 to turn it into a gay bar. There was no running water behind the bar. Used glasses were simply passed through a tub of water and immediately reused. There were no fire exits and terrible plumbing. Customers were inspected through a peephole before being allowed in and had to sign a book before proceeding. Most were male, with a few transvestites and occasional lesbians. A small room at the rear of the club catered to drag queens. It was the only gay bar in New York which allowed dancing, however, so it became known as the gay bar of the city. In the week prior to the riots, police raids increased, with the Stonewall raided just five days before, as well as four gay bars being forced to close completely. For gay people in 1969, there was a constant threat of intimidation and imprisonment. <laughs> On June 28, 1969, at 1.20 a.m. in the morning, police raided the Stonewall Inn for the second time that week. Bursting through the front door, the detective shouted, Police! We're taking the place. While raids were common and most people in gay bars were accustomed to the procedure, that night was a little bit different. There were patrons who'd never been through a raid. They panicked and tried to escape. Some patrons refused to show identification. Realizing resistance was in the air, police announced they were arresting everyone, which was about 200 people. They began to bully patrons physically and verbally. They ended up releasing some of the customers, but instead of leaving the area, they gathered outside, joined by onlookers from the neighborhood. Police backup was delayed, and the crowd grew restless. As employees of the bar were put into police vehicles, someone shouted, gay power, and another one started singing, we shall overcome. Yeah. Rumors began to spread that police were beating customers inside the bar. An officer shoved a transvestite who hit him on the head with her purse. A woman being arrested struggled and fought with police, who had hit her on the head with a billy club simply for complaining that her handcuffs were too tight. She faced the crowd, which had grown to ten times the number of those being arrested, and asked why they weren't doing anything. An officer picked her up, threw her into the back of the paddy wagon, and that's what started the riots. The crowd moved toward the police, who incited them more by trying to restrain them. Tires of police vehicles were slashed and the crowd worked to overturn the paddy wagon. Coins and bottles were hurled at the police with shouts of faggot cops and pigs. People outnumbered the police by about 500. Bricks were thrown, parking meters uprooted, and several police men and women and several handcuffed patrons retreated to the Stonewall and barricaded themselves inside. The crowd broke through the front doors, and the police drew their weapons. Lighter fluid was squirted on the bar, and it was set on fire. Soon after, fire trucks and the tactical police force arrived. The fire was put out, and the crowd was pushed back by a wall of police. Some in the crowd started impromptu kick lines, singing, We are the Stonewall Girls. We wear our hair in curls. We don't wear underwear. We show our pubic hair. <gasps> Uh, the night ended with police beatings, chases through the streets, and general chaos until four in the morning. The stone wall was smashed and destroyed. The next day, graffiti adorned the walls around the bar, proclaiming drag power, they invaded our rights, support gay power, and legalize gay bars. The next night, rioting broke out again in larger numbers and more aggressively. Fires were started in garbage cans, car windows were shattered, and the battle continued until the early morning. Activity continued for two to three days. All of this was new. Police actions on other groups had created riots in the past, but homosexuals were not supposed to fight back. As soon as the second night, as soon as the second night of the riots, gay couples were openly kissing on city streets. The sudden exhibition of public affection by homosexuals was as revolutionary as it was instantaneous. Flyers were distributed in the days afterwards reading, Get the Mafia and the Cops out of the Gay Bars. They called for gays to own their own establishments and pressured the mayor to investigate. Such open opposition from homosexuals was completely new. Not everyone appreciated the riots. Members of the Mattachine Society, as well as others who'd, been, who'd long been working on gay rights, condemned the actions calling them embarrassing, stating that what they'd done hurt the equality movement. They labeled participants screaming queens, disorderly, tacky, and cheap. The Village Voice ran stories with descriptions such as lip wrists, calling the first day of the riots the Sunday fag follies. This triggered another riot when a mob showed up at the offices of the Village Voice and threatened to burn it down. Despite criticism, the Stonewall Rights were an explosive and positive turning point in our battle. It changed everything. It changed the rules. 
While the Mattachine Society suggested things like amicable and sweet candlelight vigils, they were met with sweet bullshit. Gay rights groups like the Gay Liberation Front and the Gay Activist Alliance Forum with slogans, yeah! with slogans like, do you think homosexuals are revolting? You bet your sweet ass we are. Because of the riots,